This is the DMT One to One Show, episode 22 on the 14th of August 2013, an interview with the digital music distributor Emu Bands. It's a great to welcome today on the DMT One to One Show uh, Ali Gray, a co founder and CEO at the company Emu Bands. So, hi Ali, and great to have you on. How's it going? Great, thanks yourself. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's going great. It's a nice uh, Monday here in London. And how, how's it going in Glasgow? Uh, I'm actually up in, uh, in Wick in the very north of Scotland just now, and it's a bit grey, but um, right. that's our summers. <laughs> so you're up in the Highlands? <laughs> yes. Oh, nice. Lovely. And uh, so uh, Emu Bands is a digital distribution uh, service, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about you know what you guys do and uh, talk about digital distribution in general a little bit as well and cover some of the, the uh, subjects that have been, has been in the headlines for the past few weeks. And so first of all, uh, tell me all about Emu Bands. Uh, how did you guys start out, uh, you know, when did you decide to start the company and how did it evolve from there? Well, as you say, we are a digital music distribution service, so we work with artists and independent record companies and we supply their music to digital services like iTunes and Spotify and so on. Yeah. Um, where we're slightly different um, from other distributors is in our pricing structure in that we just charge a one-off fee depending on how many tracks are on a release. So starting from £24.95 for a single, yeah. up, up to £49.95 for an album, and then we pay 100% of all the royalties collected to the artist. Yeah. Um, we actually started in 2005, so we've been going for quite a while. Um, the kind of story behind how we formed was uh, myself and the other co-founder, Matt Kennedy, we were working at another distribution company. Yeah. Um, they would only deal with record labels, however, and at the time I was managing an unsigned artist, and so to get their album onto iTunes was it was quite a convoluted licensing process. I had to license it to one of the labels I was working with. They had to license it back to the company that, that we were working for, um, and it was all getting quite complicated. And at the end of the process, we just kind of thought I would have paid someone fifty pounds just to do all that, yeah. and that's kind of how the idea was was born for Emu Bands. Yeah, and it's an interesting model because uh, uh, I found uh, myself in the process of uh, deciding who I was uh, choosing in terms of the digital distribution service a while ago for an old band, uh, old album of of a band I was in, and uh, it was a. Uh, it's kind of confusing. Like if you if you actually go through and do the research and look at all the different distribution services, uh, there's a fair f amount of confusion on fees. Then you have to look at annual fees, what the renewal mm -hmm. fees are, if the company is taking any percentage out of, of what you're making, and, and so it becomes a fairly difficult choice to make. And so, uh, how do you find bands react to your offer of you know a fixed fee, which is uh, higher than uh, some of the other services, but it, it's also all inclusive so you don't have to pay for renewals you don't have to pay uh, anything out of your royalties or anything like that yeah i think uh, they appreciate the simplicity of it um rather than you know as you say trying to work out how much this is going to cost every year and you know what happens every time a new store is launched at least with us yeah. they know they've, they've paid their fee and when a new service comes along they'll get distributed to that for free if they want so simplicity is is one of the things we really we strive for you know it's the, the back end of distribution is quite a complicated process, but yeah. we want to make it as simple as possible for the artist so they can concentrate on the more creative side of their career. Yeah, sure. And looking at uh, the way that um, artists have uh, evolved in, in the way they release uh, their music as well, you know, uh, we talk a lot about uh, artists moving from you know an album structure to a more like fluid single structure, or maybe more EPs. Uh, you know, maybe once a year instead of doing an album every two mm -hmm. or three years. Is that something that you, you find also uh, from the artists that are working with Emu Bands? Have you found uh, any, uh, you know, shift in the, in the past uh, five, six years in, in the way they decide to structure their releases uh, through the year? I think it's different for every artist. I don't think there's a, a kind of one-size-fits-all approach. Certainly yeah. when when we started out, we were, you know, dealing with a lot of artists who had released albums previously and wanted to get them on iTunes. So at the start, we would really just be dealing with a lot of albums. Yeah. Um, they, you'd find that a lot of artists wouldn't have put their old singles for sale because the single was also on the album. Yeah. Um, nowadays, you get some artists who want you know regular singles or regular EPs just to keep momentum building for a campaign. Yeah. But you do still get a lot of artists that that go for the the sort of single album touring, you know, the the traditional schedule. So it varies, um, but certainly a lot of artists are just releasing more singles more often yeah. than you know the the traditional cycle. 
Yeah, and, and how hard or how easy is it to keep an eye on who's uh, releasing uh, what? Because I know that you know, most distribution services and, and yourselves included have uh, also the um, opportunity to offer, you know, to look at the sync opportunities for the artists that uh, have the music on the site. And, but of course, that is always a question of volume and how many tracks you actually manage to listen to and, and what happens on that, on that end. So the, the, how do you find the whole process of working out? Well, I mean, as well as um, the, you know, we get a lot of releases through the system, and we obviously have to yeah. data check every single release to make sure all the metadata meets the, the store requirements. Yeah. So we, we are, you know, kind of constantly creating our release schedules to send them through to the retailers, yeah. and through that and through our contacts in kind of press and radio, we we do try and pick up as much as we can on, you know, if there's a buzz happening with a, a specific release, we do rely a lot on the artist telling us what's happening. Yeah. Um, for example, if you wanted to apply for a feature, you know, to be on the homepage of iTunes, for example, there is a, an application process. So we have a, a form that the artist fills out that tells us what's going on. Um, and we create our release schedules and then try and push for features for specific releases. Yeah, so you can make a case, um, a case to iTunes, including the press and uh, anything that's happened yeah. to the album. Yeah, generally, it's, it's, it's pretty much the, you know, the one page that you would send uh, to a, a PR company or a, a plugger is, is exactly the yeah. same as we need. Yeah, sure. And uh, looking at the streaming equation, of course, that's that's really coming to its own in the last uh, two or three years. And uh, I would imagine it's starting to bring in some money as well uh, for yeah. uh, even for smaller artists. And so, uh, how do you find your own artists reacting to the whole Spotify, you know, uh, audio deezer debate? And are any of them contemplating not having their music on the services, or is it just a given that it has to be on there? Well, some artists are still a bit apprehensive about streaming services. Um, you know, we we try to offer advice as much as we can on, you know, we, we want to know what the artist's circumstances are before yeah. we'll advise on what services um, they, they go on to. Some will hold back a, a, a release from a streaming service until they've, they've got the initial downloads. Some actually put it up for streaming before it's available for download. So again, it's a, it, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. It, it's up to each artist, but we will advise where we can. We do have some artists doing incredibly well from streaming streaming services. Um, we've even got some artists that are not on download services, they, they purely go for the Spotify and, and the Deezer um, services. So again, it's, it, it varies from artist to artist, but in terms of individual uh, streaming services, I mean, Spotify are, are now, the, the royalties we're collecting from Spotify are now very, very significant. Yeah, interesting. Uh, looking at the international market, um, uh, I know that, uh, that there are a lot of artists uh, in uh, various countries from, from Thailand to China to uh, Japan that are looking at breaking or at least selling their music into the Western market. So do you find that some of those actually come through you to sell their music into the uh, worldwide stores, uh, including Spotify, iTunes and all those? Sure, yeah. I mean, about three quarters of the artists we work with are UK based and yeah. the other 25% are from all over the world. Um, we had initial uh, growth in USA and Sweden in particular. Um, we had quite a lot of artists from there because obviously Spotify is a Swedish service yeah. um, and we are one of the recommended suppliers to Spotify. We had a lot of Swedish artists coming through us. Same with, you know, when Deezer launched, we had a lot more French artists. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do have a lot of international artists, um, not so many from Japan, um, yeah. quite a few from Vietnam actually. Okay, cool. Which is a nice surprise. Interesting, <laughs> absolutely. Looking at the, so you, you're talking about the, you know, two thirds of, of the traffic coming from, uh, uh, or three, three quarters of the traffic three coming quarters, from the yeah. UK, yeah. Uh, and so how, how much of that is coming from Scotland specifically, and uh, how is the, how's the scene uh, Working out in Scotland, how, how do you see artists progressing and 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 you know trying to make a, a career for themselves over there? Yeah, it's probably about half and half between yeah. Scotland and the rest of the UK. Obviously, um, we are pretty well known in Scotland, and we've got very good links around Scotland. Yeah. I mean, for example, one of my other roles is I'm a board member of the Scottish Music Industry Association. Yeah. So you know, it's people know who we are, and people feel comfortable with us in Scotland. You know, I'm not saying <laughs> elsewhere they're not comfortable with us. <laughs> sure. Uh, but we're we're very well known. Yeah. Um, and so we're kind of known to to help with grassroots level Scottish. Right. 
music and we do a lot of you know conferences events um where we go and speak to artists and, and give advice and you know myself and one of the other directors Stuart we we speak on a lot of panels um and people appreciate that you know they get to know who we are so yeah we're, we're known in, in Scotland as helping grassroots music and you know that's it's, it's a great reputation to have and I, I don't want to put you in the spotlight but in terms of the uh, cities what, what would what would you say is the most vibrant uh, city in Scotland at the moment in terms of you know the number of venues and the number of bands that are playing around and, and just a uh, general buzz well, the live music scene in Glasgow is uh, is probably the biggest in Scotland. I mean, I'm I'm from Glasgow. The company's based in Glasgow, so maybe we're a little bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we've got um, great venues. You know, like King Tut's is a very famous small venue in yeah. uh, in Glasgow. Um, so yeah, the, the the live music scene in Glasgow is is very very good, and that's kind of you know I was a promoter in Glasgow as well, so that's how we got to know a lot of musicians, a lot of artists in the early days of emu bands. Um, Edinburgh's got a good live music scene as well. Obviously, the, the the Edinburgh Festival goes on in August, so that kind of overshadows perhaps the the normal gigging scene. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Glasgow's the the kind of main capital of live music, I would say. Yeah. And finally, a question I asked uh, as most uh, the distribution services I've had on the show before, uh, which is talking about uh, the number of services that are coming into play. Uh, every week, you know, new services uh, sprouting, sprouting up in uh, almost every corner of the world. And so, mm. uh, how do you go about selecting which ones it's worth actually making a deal with and figuring out which ones, you know, you, you know, are going to be here in, in, you know, one, two, three years time? Well, we have various conditions on uh, what we will what a company needs to have in place before we will license them you know yeah. we're not just going to take any old contract that we're offered we, we do try and negotiate the best deals possible for our artists um we need to to see that they're you know going to be a, a meaningful service um we do get offers a lot of the time and you know unfortunately due to resources we have to prioritize some so yeah. the you know the the what's going to be most relevant to our artists will put a, a service up the queue so to speak yeah, that's great. Well, Ali, it was great having you on, and it's emubands.com. Uh, uh, go and check that's it out. It. Uh, they also have uh, uh, some nice use resources and FAQs and uh, anything like that if you want to know more about the service. And uh, uh, talk soon. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening to the DMT One to One Show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com for our weekly news show. If you enjoyed the show, remember to check out our weekly music tech news show on digitalmusictrends.com.